So at this time, what we're going to do is open up the Bible. We're going to turn to 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel. Going Old Testament this time. Book of 1 Samuel. As we go before the Lord in prayer once again, Father, we thank you for an opportunity to get into your word some more, Lord. And we do pray that you would help us to have receptive and open hearts and ears to receive whatever it is you have for us to also be receptive to whatever it is you desire to do in us and through us. And we pray tonight, Father, that you'll be glorified during this service. And I do pray for the gift of teaching. I pray that I would decrease and you increase. And Lord, may you give us fresh insight. Give us those spiritual nuggets, Lord. You know exactly what we need to hear at this time. And so, Lord, we do pray for a timely word, and we do expect a timely word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the book of 1 Samuel. And so whenever we start a new book, we like to start with an introduction. And so I'm going to start with the brief introduction to the book of 1 Samuel. Now, as far as the human writer of the book of 1 Samuel is concerned, that human writer is not stated. Now, we know that God, we know that the Holy Spirit is the author of the entire Bible. But we also know that he called and set aside certain men, certain individuals to write down his breathed out word. He breathed it out and he uses or he used men to write it down. And so the human writer is not stated, but Many believe that Samuel himself was likely involved in the process. However, he couldn't have written the whole book of 1 Samuel because he died within this book. Therefore, many believe that 1 Samuel could have, yes, been written mostly by Samuel, but some believe that it was finished by the prophets Nathan and Gad after his death and and some would refer to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 29 to prove that point. Now, as far as the date is concerned of when it was, was written, we, we can't be totally sure. So we're not sure of the date, but some sources say that the events of 1 Samuel span approximately 100 years. And so from about 1100 B.C. until about 1000 BC is a date that many people use for the date of this book of 1 Samuel. Now in your research, you may find out that the books of 1 and 2 Samuel were originally just one book that is in the Hebrew Bible. And the book of Samuel was first divided into two books when the uh, Septuagint came into being. And so the Septuagint, by the way, is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, which means that it would have been translated from Hebrew into Greek between 200 BC to about 150 BC or during the third and second centuries BC. Now this word Septuagint actually means 70 and it comes from the 72 scholars who were enlisted from Jerusalem to come to Alexandria in Egypt. And so they were enlisted to come together and to work on this translation, this Septuagint. Now, since then, since, since it was translated into Greek, we have retained that separation of First and Second Samuel even in our English Bibles. Now, this book of 1 Samuel, what it does is tell the story of the transition in Israel from the period of the judges to the era of the kings and the prophets. And when we come to the end of the book of Judges, we get a picture of what things were like. Because in 
Judges 21 verse 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so when we start 1 Samuel in chapter 1, this is still the time of the judges. No king. Everyone was doing what they thought was right. That is, in their own eyes. And those people who served as judges or defenders, they were judges in a heroic sense. You know, we think of judges in those black robes and the gavels, but they were judges in a heroic sense. They were stopgap leaders in between the leadership of Joshua and the appointment of Saul as king. And Saul, of course, is going to be the first king that we're going to see in this study here. But these judges were deliverers. And though judges were usually military leaders, they also exercised administrative duties. And some of them are not even reported to have led any armies at all. And Samuel, we'll come to find out, was the last of all the judges. But instead of being a military deliverer or a military hero, he would be more of a spiritual deliverer. He was also a priest. And he was also the first in a new line of prophets after Moses. He was not the first prophet overall in the scriptures, but he was the first in a new line of prophets after Moses. And this Samuel, he would go on to anoint the first two kings in Israel, Saul, and then he would go on to anoint the one who come after him, King David. So not only does this book, this first Samuel, not only does it show the transition from the judges to the kings, but it also shows the transition from Saul to David. Although David doesn't assume the throne in first Samuel, but in short, In 1 Samuel, what we see is the beginning of the kingdom that was led by a human king. And we see it all the way to the end of that first king, King Saul. But we also see King David. We also see him growing and he's being prepared to reign on the throne of Israel. And so we see that growth. We see him getting to that point where he's reaching his potential in becoming that second king of Israel. And from what I read and from what I prayed about as I went over the book of 1 Samuel, what I saw was a theme or a main message for all of us that we can glean from this book. And that theme or that main message that will come together as we unpack every chapter and every verse in 1 Samuel is reaching your full potential in Christ. And so as we work towards that that theme or that main message we'll get from 1 Samuel, what we want to do is start with one study. And we're going to start with chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. And the title of tonight's message is, You Don't Know Me. You Don't Know Me. Now it says in verse 1, now, there was a certain man of Ramathiam Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim. And his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah and the name of the other Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man, Elkanah, he went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies, where? In Shiloh. And also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. They were there in Shiloh. And so we learn a few things about this man, Elkanah, who would go on to become the father of Samuel. Well, first of all, we learn that he lived in Ramathiam Zophim, which was north of Jerusalem. 
And this place was also known as Ramah. And it was a town in the hill country of Ephraim. Now from the scriptures here, it says that he was an Ephraimite. But it was only in the sense of where he lived. Because he lived in the tribal area of Ephraim. Now Elkanah was actually from the tribe of Levi. So he was a Levite. And again, he was just an Ephraimite in the sense that he lived in the area of the tribe of Ephraim. But this man had two wives. And one was named Hannah and the other Peninnah. And it says that he has sons and daughters with Peninnah. And we'll find out that later. We'll find that information out in the following verses. But this man Elkanah, he appeared to be faithful in worshiping the Lord of hosts. And the Lord of hosts, by the way, is a military term. And according to one source, Lord of hosts stresses that the Lord is the ultimate leader of Israel's armies. It also underscores the fact of his universal sovereignty over all nations and over all creation. Thus, when you think of the Lord of hosts, it encompasses his universal rule over all forces, whether in heaven or on earth. And it also anticipates his eventual subjugation of all those who oppose him. So this is the Lord of hosts, the ultimate leader. Now notice that Elkanah took his family to Shiloh. He took them there to worship and sacrifice to the Lord. Excuse me. Now, at that time, Shiloh, which means place of rest, it was the central place of worship. It was north of Ramah, and it was 20 to 30 miles north of Jerusalem. And in Shiloh during that time, this is where the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant were located. And it was there since the time of Joshua. If you want to read Joshua chapter 18. And so it's been there that entire time. But also from the scripture, we learn that there's a new high priest in town that we become acquainted with. And this high priest is Eli. And this Eli also served as judge during this time. And he had a couple sons, his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They served as priests. And later on in the studies, as we move on in 1 Samuel, we're going to learn about these corrupt priests a little later. I mean, it's pretty bad what they do, but of course we can't get into everything right now. But in verses 4 and 5, it says, and whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, it says that he would give portions of the sacrificial meat to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. See, in Leviticus chapter 7, we see that the person who offered a peace offering to the Lord, they would also eat a portion of that offering. Because the peace offering spoke of fellowship and communion. And so when a person offered peace offering, they were having fellowship with the Lord. They would burn some of it to to the Lord, the best piece, the fat and so forth. But then they would sit down and they would eat their portion of it and have fellowship with him. And so he's given portions. This Elkanah is given portions to both of his wives and to Peninnah's children because he only has children with her. But the scriptures tell us that, oh, he loved Hannah. He gave her a double portion, even though she was childless, she was barren. And during that time, and many of you know this, you know the story, women felt the shame because they were unable to bear children. If that were the case, they were ashamed. It's a bad stigma upon them. And that's because children are seen as a blessing from God, and that has not changed, even though the world would say differently. Children are a blessing from the Lord. 
And to many in ancient Israel, childlessness was even considered a curse. And some of us tonight are in the same position as Hannah. We see so-called penanas around us and they're bearing children and they're being fruitful and blessings are being experienced by them. But some of us are like Hannah and we are childless, so to speak. And I'm talking about metaphorically, we're waiting to give birth to our blessings. We're waiting to experience blessings and goals and dreams that we've had since our youth, things we've been praying for for years, situations we've wanted to change for years even decades, and, and we seem to be childless in that respect. Again, metaphorically, we seem to be barren in that respect and seeing the fulfillment of our goals and of our dreams and situations that we want to see turned around and people we've been praying for who are not saved and people we've been praying for who are struggling and we'd like to see them doing well and living for the Lord. We like to see them healed, but all oh, our prayers seem to go unanswered. Things to be, these seem to be taken so long, and we seem to be barren in regard to blessings and prayers being answered the way we want them to be answered because they are being answered. It's just not the way we always want them to be answered. But it says her rival, Hannah's rival, speaking of Peninnah, the other wife, also provoked or taunted Hannah severely to make her miserable. She irritated her because the Lord had closed her womb, had closed Hannah's womb. And so it was on a yearly basis or year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord, she provoked, she taunted Hannah, and therefore Hannah wept. The scriptures tell us, and she did not eat. She's in misery right now. She's depressed. She's down. You see, Hannah had to put up with this taunting from Peninnah year after year. It was like clockwork. You know, and, and, and in their situation, in Hannah's situation, Elkanah's situation, Peninnah's situation, you You see an example of why doing marriage God's way is best. You see why when when people tell us that homosexuality is okay or having multiple wives is okay or stepping outside of our marriage and committing adultery is okay. When people say that and we say no, we take them to the scriptures and say no, that's sin according to the word of God. When we say that people get upset with us, but But guess what? God knows what's best. He's the one who created marriage. And we see a situation here when where a person is miserable. There's fighting going on. There's taunting going on. There's depression going on. So it's always best to to do marriage since we're speaking of marriage God's way. And we see a similar situation to what Hannah was going through in Genesis chapter 30, verses 1 and 2. We see that with Rachel and Jacob. And remember, Jacob's name will later on be changed into Israel. That's where we get the 12 tribes of Israel from, from Jacob. But he was married to Rachel, but he was also married to Leah, the older sister He was tricked into that, but you still see that situation with multiple wives. And Leah was able to have children with Jacob, but Rachel, the one that Jacob really loved, she was barren. And we see that same situation here with Hannah and Elkanah and Peninnah. But yes, in the Old Testament, we see that God allowed it, but it doesn't mean he approved of it. There's a difference. There's some things in the scripture that we would call descriptive and some things we call prescriptive. Prescriptive is God's perfect will. Prescriptive is God's design and what he wants. And so what's prescriptive is about marriage is that marriage is made for one genetic male and one genetic female, and they're supposed to be together until death separates. That is prescriptive. That's God's design. 
But what we see here is descriptive. In other words, the Bible is just telling the truth about what happened. And what happened here is that this man, Elkanah, had two wives. And you see the issues that are going on. And again, these issues, because marriage here is not being done God's way. But, but guess what? Because there's some of us who are not married. There's some of us whose marriages are working really well. But this example that I'm giving can also be uh, used for other examples in life. We can plug anything here, whatever it is that you want to plug in. If it's not the way God designed it, it's not going to work right. It's just not. It's going to fall apart. You're going to be miserable. There's some people who do things outside of God's will and God allows it. That's permissive will, allows it, not his perfect will. His perfect will is what he prefers. But some people, they rather go in a permissive will, go against the perfect will of God, and they do things that are sometimes sinful, make poor decisions, and reap the consequences of it, and then turn around and want to blame God for it. So we could plug anything here. Not just marriage, but anything. If it's not done the way God designed it, if we don't use it the way God designed it, then somebody's going to end up hurt. But notice the taunts from Peninnah towards Hannah. Notice that these taunts would occur when Hannah went up to the house of the Lord. Out of all times, why you got to taunt me while I'm going to worship but I like to remind you, and some of you know this, and some of you know where I'm going with this, even as we're getting dressed to go to church. Maybe some of you on your way here tonight, or, or maybe this past Sunday, maybe some of you experienced this as you're getting ready to go to church, as you're getting ready to worship, as you're getting ready to have that family study, as you're getting ready to go into your prayer closet and have that quiet time with the Lord and pray to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. As you're getting ready for that, as you're on your way, the enemy begins to taunt you. And he begins to say, oh, you're praying and going, you're going back to church again. I remember what you did last week. Or I remember what you said. I remember that. I, I remember what you were watching. Oh, you hypocrite. You're going to church. Or I remember what you did when you were 15 years old. And you're going to church. And so the enemy would taunt us. You messed up this week. You're not good enough. Guess what? You're barren. You've been, you've been praying to God for this and you still haven't given birth to that blessing or, whatever, or that goal, whatever it is, that dream. And so the enemy began to taunt us even while some of us are standing right here singing songs and trying to concentrate and trying to sing to the Lord, not just about the Lord. There's a difference. I'll say that again. There's a difference between singing about the Lord and singing to the Lord. And as we're singing to the Lord, the enemy tries to distract us and try to bring us back to that place in our memory. Remember what you did last week and you're sitting here raising your hands, really? All the taunts from the enemy. Then Elkanah, verse 8, her husband said to her, Hannah, do you weep or why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? I wish somebody was there to give him advice. Elkanah didn't say the right thing. Am I not better to you than ten sons? He totally missed the mark here. He didn't understand what his wife really wanted and what she was going through. And sometimes... It is better to not speak. It's better to not talk and instead just be there for the person who's hurting. But sometimes we, we get uncomfortable with silence. And we feel like we have to break the silence and say something, even though it doesn't even make sense or fit the situation. But Proverbs, where you see a bunch of wisdom in, in Chapter 17, verse 28 says, even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. 
When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. Even a person who may be a fool, if they would just be quiet, they would appear to be intelligent. You see, I know, I know Elkanah was trying to help and he thought he was saying the right things. But he truly didn't understand what his wife was going through. He didn't understand his wife's desires. He wasn't paying attention to what was going on between his two wives. And so Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Remember, that's the center of worship during this time. And now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. This was before there was a temple, a permanent structure. And she was in bitterness of soul. She was deeply hurt and she prayed to the Lord and she wept in anguish. And so, yes, she's, she's struggling with her barrenness. She's, she's struggling with being teased by the other woman. And she's struggling with her husband not fully understanding her situation or what she's going through. But notice, she doesn't just sit there in her anguish. She doesn't just sit there in her weeping or bitterness of soul. What does she do? She prays. You know, Philippians uh, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. It tells us to be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about that Peninnah who is teasing you. Don't worry that your prayer to have a son with Elkanah hasn't come yet. And you don't worry about your situation. I know you don't know how it's going to come together. I know you don't know God's answer. Because clearly speaking, there's some things in the scripture about some situations that are just clear. This is clearly right. This is clearly wrong. But there's some things in scripture that, that you know, we can't discern whether it fits our situation or not. We can read through the entire Bible and there's nothing in there in the scriptures that will tell us, well, is it a good time to buy a car or not? So there's some things we don't know. So, so maybe you're worrying about something like that. Maybe you're worrying about, you know, not a car or a house or whatever the situation is that you can fill in the blanks on. But maybe you're anxious for something, but the scripture says, don't be Anxious for anything. Don't worry about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God in the peace of God. It's a promise which surpasses all understanding. You can't even understand it. Don't even try to blow your mind when it comes to the peace of God. It will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus as you go to the Lord in prayer about whatever you're worrying about. There's a promise here that the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds from that anxiety, from that worry, even from that fear. Just turn it over to God. And then Hannah made a vow and said in verse 11, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction, if you will look on the suffering of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then she says, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. And so she gives a vow on her potential future son's behalf that would be considered a Nazarite vow. She vows, Lord, if you would give me a son, if you would remember me, you know what I've been praying for. You would remember me, give me a son. Then he's going to be a Nazarite all of his life. And the scriptures tell us, and I believe it's in Numbers chapter 6, all the things that go along with, with having that Nazarite vow. And it includes, of course, not drinking wine. It includes staying away from dead bodies. But those of you who know the story of Samson and Judges, it also includes not cutting the hair, just letting the hair grow. See, but people like Samson and Samuel, they, were, they would be lifelong Nazarites. And this is something that Hannah vowed before he was even conceived. So I guess that's a spoiler alert. She's going to be the mother of Samuel, but of course we're not there yet. 
See, some of us think of, 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 of um, Samson, not Samuel. People think of Samson as being strong because of his hair. But Samuel is going to be a Nazarite too, and he wasn't super strong like Samson. And so what does the hair symbolize? That long hair symbolizes their commitment or dedication to the Lord. So going back to the previous judge, Samson, his strength came from his commitment to the Lord. And the hair was only a symbol of that inward commitment. And Samuel will grow up and he will be a Nazarite and his hair won't be cut. A lifelong Nazarite. And his hair too would represent his commitment to the Lord. See, some of us in here, we, we're not able to grow long hair. <laughs> I wasn't talking about anybody. <laughs> I did used to have a ponytail, though. I mean, if that counts. But some of us are not able to grow long hair. Some of us don't even have the money or even want to spend anything on hair extensions. However, our our lifestyle should be an extension of our inner commitment to him. And so we don't take a literal Nazarite vow or anything like that. But once again, our lifestyle should be an outward symbol of our inward commitment to the Lord. And so that's how Samuel would be. That's what Hannah vowed to the Lord. She would just if he would just bless her with the son. And it happened in verse 12, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth, the high priest, he, he watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart and only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I'm discouraged. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace and may the God of Israel, grant your petition. May he grant your request, which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant or your woman servant find favor or acceptance in your sight. And so the woman went away and she ate and her face was no longer sad. You see, just like the situation with Eli and Hannah, There's many people who cross our paths when we gather on a Sunday morning or we gather on a Wednesday night or people cross our paths in life in general. And one thing we learn from Eli's encounter with Hannah is not to make assumptions about people because Eli thought that she was drunk. He thought she was drunk because she prayed in her heart. She prayed silently, but her lips We're moving. And so he made an assumption that that she was drunk. And so he asked that question in, in verse 14. How long will you be drunk? And so for us today, we may not ask people that question. How long will you be drunk? As we see them come across us in life or we come across them on Sunday or Wednesday. We may not ask them that question, but some of us make have assumptions and we may ask or wonder in our minds as we see certain people doing certain things in church or maybe in the home and we may wonder why is that person so animated why they sing the worship songs and so some people assume that oh they are just showing off they're they're animated as the songs are being played as the songs are being led by the worship team and they're so animated in their worship they must 
be showing off is the assumption some may have. And some people may ask a question when, when they see a person at every event and every Bible study. And we do have those saints here, praise God, who you see them at every event. You see them at different Bible studies throughout the week. And they're just hungry for the word of God. And some people may look at those people and assume they're at this event again. They're at this Bible study again. Well, this person may have no life. They may come to that assumption. They may ask even in their hearts, oh, look at all these people lingering so much after church. Why do they linger so much after church? Come on, it's time for lunch. Why are you lingering so much? The service is over. It's about to be next Sunday and there's going to be another service. Come on, why are they lingering so much? And some may assume or they just want to linger just because they want to be cool. You see, Eli is not the only one who makes assumptions about people in the house of God. Eli is not the only one who is making assumptions about prayer warriors and worshipers of the true and the living God. You know, some people may look at others doing service instead of paying attention to the message and they see someone writing during service and they're like, why is that person writing? What are they writing? How come every time a slide goes up, they take out their fancy cell phones and take a picture? Oh, they just want to show off their cell phones or that person is not really writing anything. They're just doodling. They're drawing pictures of Snoopy or something. <laughs> and so people are making these assumptions. It's not just Eli. Or you may hear some people in church say amen, maybe a little louder than you're saying it. Maybe you're saying it in your mind or under your breath, but you hear this one brother or sister in Christ in church saying amen, and they're shouting it out. And some of you may have this assumption, oh, they just want to sound more spiritual. They think they're more spiritual or more Christian than I am, making assumptions. Or some may look at others or look at their Bibles or look at their tablets as they're reading their Bibles on their tablets. And, and they may say, why is that person's Bible all marked up? Why is every single line highlighted? That person just doesn't respect the Bible. They don't respect the word of God because they have notes all in the margin. They have all kinds of highlight, every color. They just don't respect the word of God. And some come to that assumption, making assumptions like Eli and somebody comes across someone who has multiple prayer times. Why is that person praying so much? What are they praying about? Or oh, this person, they just want to pray or pretend to pray because they just want to be the next Paul. They just want to be the next prophet. They just want to be or think they're better than us making assumptions. See, but some people are going through a serious situation and we don't even know it. Some people are going through a tough situation like Hannah was going through. Maybe not her exact situation, but people are going through it and you don't even know it because you're not taking the time to learn about it. We're making assumptions. We're being judgmental. But maybe it is that that person is animated in worship because they're celebrating God in spite of. Oh, they know that their situation is messed up. They, they know that they've been praying for a while and they don't see any fruit or results, but they understand that they serve a good God. They understand that they serve a mighty God. So they're animated in worship because maybe they know that they're going to celebrate this awesome God anyway. Maybe that's their heart. Maybe that person who is at every event or Bible study, maybe it's not because they don't have a life. Maybe it's because there's no other positive influences in their lives. There's, there's nothing at home. There's no family that they can run to, but they can come around the body of Christ in the Bible study and they can be fed and they can be encouraged and they can be edified in the Lord. And maybe that person that we look at and they're marking up their Bible. They highlighted everything and we think, oh, they're disrespecting the word of God. Maybe 
that Bible is marked up so much because it's those very words that they highlighted or underlined that's holding them together. Those very words. Without those words, there'll be havoc in their lives, even more than what is there. But it's those very words that are highlighted and underlined that's holding them together, that's holding the pieces of their lives together, the promises of God that they can stand upon, that gives them hope, that increases the hope that's within them. But we see here that Hannah corrected Eli and she told him that, hey, I'm not drinking alcohol. In fact, in other words, she's saying, I'm not pouring anything into me. In fact, I'm pouring out of me. What you're seeing here is me pouring out my soul to the Lord. And for some of us, it's during those multiple prayer times that we get to pour out our soul to the Lord. Things that we can't tell a friend or a family member. They just wouldn't understand or maybe they'll be judgmental. But, but during that time of prayer with the Lord, we have that opportunity to pour out our soul to him. And, and that's when we experience the, the most peace we've had for that entire day. You know, so... So don't assume the worst about people. Don't, don't take a note from Eli in that portion of the study. Because we don't know what, what people are going through. In fact, the question should be, are we ready to minister to those people? That's what we should be asking ourselves. Are we ready to minister to those people? You see, Hannah had been beaten down, right? She's been beaten down emotionally by Peninnah. She's been beaten down by her inability to bear children. And she found no comfort from her husband's words, from Elkanah's words. And it's been like this, not one day, not two days, not one year, but, but for years it's been this way. But guess what we see in tonight's study? We saw that finally someone said something that she's probably never heard before. She heard something encouraging. It encouraged her in verse 17 when he told her to go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. So if we make ourselves available and allow the Lord to use us, we can help someone come out of their slump. Just like Hannah came out of her slump as the worship team comes to the stage. Because if you notice, after Eli said what he said, it said in verse 18, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate and it said, and notice this, her face was no longer sad. The words that came out of Eli's mouth, well, at first they were judgmental and he made assumptions. But then he gave her a word of encouragement. And she came out of her slump. And for those of us in this room or, room or those of us who are online watching, we can be an encouragement to others as well. We can help people come out of their slump. And one thing we can do is to be ready to listen. Be ready to listen. Because after Eli assumed that she was drunk and told her to put away that drink, put away the wine, put away the alcohol, Hannah responded to that criticism, not disrespectfully, but respectfully. She responded and essentially in her response, she said, you don't know me. Oh, you think I'm a drunkard. You, you think I'm drunk right now but no I'm a woman who have poured out my soul before the Lord and there's some people that maybe we're assuming some things about them maybe we're we're judging them maybe in our hearts or maybe we'd actually said something to them and and they will essentially have those same words you don't know me you don't you don't know what I'm going through and so I like what Eli does here when she responded, he actually listened. He actually listened. But another way we can help people come out of their slump is to be ready to share what God 
wants you to share with them. But whatever we share with them, it, it should line up. It must line up with the word of God. And Eli's words did line up with the word of God. And we'll see that in verses 19 and 20. When Hannah gives birth to Samuel. And so are we available to be used? Are we sensitive to the Holy Spirit as we encounter people? Are we sensitive to him so that he'll give us a word to share, a timely word to share in their time of need, to help them to come out of the slump that they're in? And no, we may not know their entire story. We may not know exactly how that person feels, but we can encourage them with the word of God. We can encourage them with the message from the Lord. Because the message that we carry to them, that we bring to them, will be a message from that very God who loves them and that very God who has not forgotten them nor their situation. But are we available? Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. Yes, Lord. Or forgive us, Lord, for those times that we've been judgmental and we just thought things about people, assumed things about people, and that's not even the true story. But help us, Lord, to judge righteous judgment, as your word said. But help us to be good listeners. Yes. Help us to be compassionate. Help us, Lord, to yes. be open and receptive, to receive a timely word from you to share with them. And Father, I pray for anyone tonight who's having a Hannah type of experience, Lord, and maybe they are literally trying to have children. Maybe it could be that, or, or maybe it's some other situation and they're just waiting for the fruition of their goals or their dreams to be seen, to be met. So I pray, Lord, that you would encourage them, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you stir their hearts to seek your face. And I do pray that you would give them a clear answer to whatever it is they're praying about or whomever it is they're praying for. And I just pray that you use my brothers and sisters throughout the remainder of this week to be a blessing to somebody, Lord, that you would bring somebody in their path that they can minister to and even witness to, Father, and that you will empower my brothers and sisters by your Holy Spirit. Equip them, Lord, for your great work, Lord. It's a privilege to serve you. And I pray, Lord, that you bless them, Lord, on the way home. Give them traveling grace. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.